Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing cystic fibrosis and cystic fibrosis medications. Okay, right. So, we have just been discussing the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator, which is also known as CFTR, or also as the ATP binding cassette transporter C7. Okay, uh, now this is really a broken uh, ATP driven active transporter. Okay, and the result of this is that now what it has become is an ion channel for chloride anions that is gated by ATP but is unusual for a ligand gated ion channel in that um, it breaks down its ligand in the process of opening in response to that ligand. So in the gating process it breaks down its ligand. Okay, so a reminder that this is the structure of CFTR. We have the transmembrane domain 1 here, which is a cluster of six membranes spanning alpha helices. The transmembrane domain 2 here, which is another cluster of six membranes spanning alpha helices. Together these two portions will form the ion channel, which will allow chloride anions to move across the um, cell membrane here. Okay, and then in between transmembrane domain 1 and transmembrane domain 2, we have these two special domains uh, known as nucleotide binding domain 1 and the regulatory domain, and then after TMD2, we have the nucleotide binding domain 2. So, the first thing that has to happen is that protein kinase A has to phosphorylate a special site on the regulatory domain. Okay, until that site is phosphorylated, the thing cannot open, it cannot even bind ATP. Okay, once protein kinase A has phosphorylated that special site on the regulatory domain, then what can happen is you can begin the cycle of opening and closing. Okay, so firstly nucleotide binding domain number 1 will bind a molecule of ATP, and then the nucleotide binding domain number 2 will bind to the nucleotide binding domain number 1. Okay, that's still not in the open state though, yet. What has to then happen is another molecule of ATP has to bind to nucleotide binding domain number 2, and that can only now bind because the nucleotide binding domain number 2 is bound and dimerized to the nucleotide binding domain number 1. Okay, so when that second molecule of ATP binds, then the thing will change conformation. The TMD1 and TMD2 will change conformation to go into the open state, and then you'll be allowing chloride anions to move uh, in whichever direction across the cell membrane. And of course, the direction in which the chloride anions will move will be down their electrochemical gradient, okay? Um, so it's not an active transporter, it's a passive transporter, it's just opening a channel through which chloride anions can move. Okay, the laws of thermodynamics will tell the chloride anions which way to net move. Okay, right. Uh, then uh, what will happen is uh, this ATP molecule that's bound to the nucleotide binding domain number 2 will be hydrolyzed down to ADP and inorganic phosphate. The inorganic phosphate will then be chucked off okay, and the ADP will remain bound, okay? This will re all remain dimerized and the entire thing will remain in the open conformation. Then what will happen is eventually the ADP will fall off and then it will revert back to this situation where you have MBD1 with an ATP bound and the nucleotide binding domain number 2 bound to that, okay, and it will be in the closed state. Then you can go around the cycle again, another ATP can come and bind here, or uh, the ATP that's bound to nucleotide binding domain number one could cleave off, and that would then uh, result in it going back to this original state up here. Okay, right. So basically, providing that the regulatory domain is phosphorylated, the thing cycles between being in the open and closed state all the time. Why? Because ATP is always going to be available in some level, okay? Cells will always have ATP in their cytoplasm, so it will always be opening and closing, basically. The concentration of ATP determines how rapidly, after closing, it will then open again, okay? Because if there's very high concentration of ATP, you won't have to wait long before another molecule of ATP binds there and takes it back to the open state. So, the concentration of ATP determines how much time it spends in the open state and how much time it spends in the closed state. Okay, right. So, that's enough on CFTR. Well, actually, it's not enough on CFTR. We now need to talk about the mutations that can occur 
in CFTR, the different classes of mutations that can occur in CFTR, okay? And these are the mutations that cause cystic fibrosis, so these are loss of function mutations. Okay, so mutations in CFTR then are grouped into five classes. Well, some people will talk about a sixth class as well. I'm not going to mention the sixth class. The reason being that if you go to different sources, they will quote um, the sixth class as being different types of mutations. Okay, so if you go to one source, you'll find out about how class six mutations result in it being degraded too fast. If you go to another source, you'll find out about how class six mutations mean that it doesn't interact with other targets such as ENAC. Okay, so basically if you go to different places they'll tell you that class 6 is something different. So I'm not going to talk about class 6 at all apart from what I've just said uh, because class 1 to 5 everyone can agree on whereas class 6 is a bit more ambiguous. So we'll talk about class 1 to 5. Okay, so class 1 mutations then firstly. Class 1 mutations are very, very, very severe mutations in CFTR. These mutations stop synthesis altogether. Okay, now how do they do this? Well, basically what happens is you are going to change a codon so that it becomes a premature stop codon. Okay, so let me give you an example of a class 1 mutation so that I can illustrate this point. So an example of a class 1 mutation is R553X. Okay, now what does this mean? This means that um, arginine, which is the um, amino acid that is uh, meant by the single letter R, so this is arginine, you might ask, well, why is it not A? Uh, well, A went to the amino acid alanine. Okay, so R is the single letter amino acid code for the amino acid arginine. Okay, so arginine at position 553 has gone to a stop codon, basically. So if I draw the protein out, remember CFTR is a big, big protein. Okay, it's 1,480 amino acids. Okay, so roughly um, a third of the way through, we have position 553, which should be an arginine. Okay, now what happens in the R553X mutation is that you get a mutation on the level of the DNA that then results in the RNA having a codon for this amino acid at position 553 that no longer codes for an arginine, but instead codes for the stop codon. Okay, so if I draw the piece of mRNA here, Okay, so this is the mRNA for the um, cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator. You will have a codon which is going to code for the 553rd amino acid in cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator. Okay, so this is the codon for this amino acid here. Okay, now normally it would be a codon that codes for an arginine, but some sort of mutation has happened in the DNA that now results in this codon being a stop codon. Okay, so this is now going to be a stop codon. Now stop codons, when they um, are read by the ribosome, there is no amino acid to put in for a stop codon. Okay, uh, so the ribosome cannot put in an amino acid, basically. It has nothing to put in there. Okay, so it just halts. It stops translation, and therefore you stop uh, extending the polypeptide any further. So what's going to happen, basically, is it's going to make the protein up to this point. Okay, and then when you get to position 553, it's going to meet this premature stop codon. Because, of course, stop codons are perfectly good when they occur in the correct position, because you want to stop translation somewhere, okay, but it should be right over here at position 1481, okay, so that you only end up with 1480 amino acids, okay. We've now got a stop code on that position 553, and that means that instead of putting an arginine in at position 553, we're just going to stop, okay? So we're going to end up with a 552 amino acid um, little fragment of CFTR. Okay, now that certainly is not going to be functional, okay? So you end up with no synthesis of normal CFTR, basically, at least from this gene that has got this mutation in, okay? So R553X is an example 
of a class 1 mutation in a C-stick fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator gene. Okay, uh, there are other class 1 mutations, there are many other examples that you could find out on the internet. Okay, uh, and if you end up with two class 1 mutations of CFTR, i.e. in your maternal and your paternal CFTR genes, then that will be very, very serious, because it means that your cells are not going to have any functional CFTR, basically, and you're going to get a very serious uh, form of cystic fibrosis. Okay, so class 1 mutations can certainly cause cystic fibrosis. Okay, we're next going to talk about class 2 mutations. Now, class 2 mutations contains the infamous example of a cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator mutation. Okay, the main one, the one that you find most of all, okay, which is the mutation Delta F508. This is the most common cystic fibrosis causing mutation in CFTR that causes loss of function of CFTR. Okay, um, so I think it's something like 70% of all the loss of function mutations in CFTR are this Delta F508 mutation. So the most common form of cystic fibrosis is caused by you having two mutations in cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator gene that are both Delta F508. Okay, so what then do class 2 mutations cause? And then we'll look specifically at what happens in Delta F508. So basically, class 2 mutations cause the protein to misfold, okay? So CFTR is going to get some mutation in that then causes it to misfold, so it doesn't fold correctly, okay? It doesn't adopt its uh, correct tertiary structure, okay? So it's not quite as serious as a premature stop codon. This stops all synthesis, okay? In class 2 mutations, you do get synthesis of the CFTR protein, okay? It's just when you actually come to folding up the CFTR protein, it ends up in the wrong shape, basically. And the cell's machinery does not like this misfolded CFTR and sends it for destruction, basically. Okay, and that's a big problem, okay? In fact, in the case of Delta F508, this little mutation, and I'll talk about exactly what happens in this in a moment, Okay, it's nowhere near as serious as one of these, okay? Um, this mutation causes the protein to slightly misfold, but the, and the cell destroys all of this protein that's misfolded. But the sad reality is that if it had actually let the protein go to the cell membrane, even though the protein was slightly misfolded, it's actually not bad. It's not that dysfunctional. It works okay. Okay, so if the cell had just let the protein go to the cell membrane, even though it was misfolded, um, you probably wouldn't get cystic fibrosis, because even though the protein wasn't ideal, it still functions to some degree. It doesn't function as well as the wild-type CFTR, uh, but it does function to some degree. So that's a little sad truth about Delta F508, that the cell kind of makes it worse by having these stringent mechanisms for destroying misfolded proteins. Okay, and right. So, uh, let's talk about the Delta F508 mutation in a little bit more detail. So, let's go back to, again to just a picture of a primary structure of polypeptide here. So, here's our polypeptide represented here. So, what does this mean? Okay, so firstly, delta. Delta is the Greek symbol that is equivalent to D. Okay, and what this stands for in the context of mutation nomenclature is deletion. Okay, so deletion of what? Of F. Okay, so what does F stand for? F is the single letter amino acid code for the amino acid phenylalanine. Okay, and again, it can't have the um, it can't have the um, symbol P. It can't be given the single letter P because that went to proline. Okay, so you can see in these, in both the cases of arginine and phenylalanine, they have kind of picked sensible single letters. Phenylalanine sounds as though it begins with F. Arginine, you know, there's kind of an R there. Okay, so they have picked sensible alternatives for the single letter codes of these amino acids. Okay, so in normal CFTR, at position 508, there should be a phenylalanine. So this is phenylalanine, F, at position 508 here. 
In this mutation, what's going to happen is you are just going to get rid of that phenylalanine, okay? We're going to get rid of that one amino acid from the entire protein, okay? So the, the entire protein is going to go down to being shorter. It's going to go down to being 1,479 amino acids rather than 1,480. And which amino acid have we lost? We've lost phenylalanine that should be at position 508, okay? Now... Where is that phenylalanine? Where is position 508? Well, position 508, if we go back to our original structure of CFTR, that residue is within the nucleotide binding domain number 1. Okay, so it's not an ideal position to get a mutation, um, but unfortunately it leads to grave enough misfolding that the protein is then destroyed by the cell's mechanism. So the cell picks this up as a badly folded protein and then says, right, destroy it. Which means that even though you make the polypeptide, okay, it doesn't then make it to the cell membrane and therefore it doesn't make a functional chloride channel because it's being destroyed by the cell's mechanisms, basically. Okay, so I should put this in. Protein misfolds, and this then leads to it being degraded, okay? So we're really kind of going up the levels. In class 1, it wasn't actually ever even made. The polypeptide isn't actually made, okay? Here, the polypeptide is made, but it doesn't get to the cell membrane because it's destroyed by the cell's mechanisms for quality control. Okay, now I would just like to talk about the mutation that underlies delta F508 in a little bit more detail, because it's a little bit more subtle than you would think. There's a little bit more complicated explanation for this, a, an interesting explanation, okay? You might just think, well, what's going to have happened is we're going to have deleted the three amino acids that contribute that... Sorry, we're going to have to take that back, start again. We're going to have deleted the free organic bases in the DNA and therefore in the RNA which code for the phenylalanine, but it's not quite that simple, okay? So let me show this to you. Okay, so I'll start with the DNA here. So let's say this is a section of the DNA for uh, cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator. Okay, so let me put in a few organic bases here. So T, A, G, and then A, A, A. Okay, right. And then I'll put in the complementary organic bases. I'll explain exactly what this means in a moment. So A is the complementary organic base to T. T is the organic base to A. Uh, this is DNA, by the way, which is why I've got thymine present in here. Okay, uh, then we've got T, T, T. Okay, right. So let's say that this little group of free organic bases here is coding for the amino acid that would be at position 508. Okay, so this is 508. And these are the real sequences. I haven't just made this up off the top of my head. These are the real sequences. Okay, and these three here, these are for position 507. Okay, now, the next thing we need to know is which strand is the coding strand and which strand is the non-coding strand. Basically, this one is the coding strand here. Okay, this one with T-A-G-A-A-A. This is the coding strand. Okay, now, what does a coding strand actually mean? Well, this is the strand that's going to be used by RNA polymerase 2 whenever it actually wants to make a piece of mRNA. Okay, so what's going to happen is we're going to make a piece of mRNA that is complementary to that coding strand. So let me draw the mRNA here. So this is the mRNA, and we're going to make it so that it is complementary to the sequence of organic bases on the coding strand here. Okay, so what's the complementary organic base to thymine? That's adenine. What's the complementary organic base to adenine? Remembering that we are RNA now, so not thymine, but uracil. The complementary organic base for guanine is cytosine, and then the complementary organic bases for the free adenines are all uracils. Okay, so this is our piece of mRNA then for our cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator, and we're specifically looking at the portions that are going to be coding for position number 507 and position number 508. So this is going to be coding for the 507th amino acid, 
This is going to be coding for position 508 amino acid. Okay, right. So, what amino acids do these then code for? Well, AUC codes for the uh, amino acid isoleucine, which has the single letter code I. So this is isoleucine here. Okay, and then UUU codes for the amino acid phenylalanine. Okay, so that's the healthy CFTR. Now, what happens in Delta F508? I said it was more complicated than just removing this code on here. Okay, so what you would think would happen is you just move, remove those free organic bases there. Okay, that would get rid of this code on here, and then you just have the next code on position 509 brought next to 507, and that would delete the phenylalanine. Okay, but it's more complicated than that. Okay, and let me show you how. What's going to happen? is you're going to delete these free organic bases here, okay, the GAACTT here, okay, and that means that you get rid of these free organic bases from the mRNA. So now what happens is in the new mRNA, what you have is you have A and U from the 507 code on here brought together with the U from 508, and that makes our new code on here, okay? And then, of course, the code on after that, position 509, will be brought next to this, okay? Now, what does AUU code for? We might be able to guess now it codes for isoleucine as well as AUC. Okay, so isoleucine has more than one code on which codes for it. Remember, the genetic code is degenerate. You have 64 plausible codons and only 20 amino acids, okay? So some codons code for the same amino acid. Okay, and this is an example here. AUC codes for isoleucine and AUU codes for isoleucine. So you end up putting the same isoleucine in position 507, but then there is no 508 anymore. 509 is now 508. Okay, so you've lost that phenylalanine, basically. Okay, so that is the more subtle account of what actually happens in Delta F508. However, the... Uh, what actually happens is that you do just remove a single amino acid. Yes, it's a, this complicated mechanism, but you do just remove a single amino acid from the protein. That causes it to misfold. It's degraded by the cell's quality control mechanisms, which means that you end up with no CFTR at the um, cell membrane if you have two of these mutations. Of course, if you only have one of them, okay, if you have one mutation in one of your CFTR genes and the other one is fine, that does not cause cystic fibrosis. You are a carrier for cystic fibrosis, but you do not have the disease. You only get the disease if you have loss of function of both of them. Okay, one is enough to function on its own. You don't need two functional ones. Of course, it's not great if you're a carrier because then if, you, uh, if your partner is also a carrier and you have children, then it's potentially possible that one of them will end up with two mutations and then get cystic fibrosis. Okay, right. Uh, so, going on to other mutations then. So we've done class 1 and class 2. Let's go over the page and continue on to class 3 and then we'll do class 4 and class 5 just to show winning. Okay, so class 1 and class 2 were very, very serious mutations. Uh, class 3 is also very serious. Class 4 and class 5 are the less serious. If you're going to choose which mutations you would like to get, okay, you choose class 4 and class 5 rather than class 1, 2 or 3. Okay, so let's now talk about class 3 mutations. So, in class 1 mutations, there were problems with even synthesizing the polypeptide. In class 2, there were problems with actually processing it and folding it up correctly and getting it to the cell membrane. In class 3, you synthesize the protein, it gets to the cell membrane, and then it doesn't actually activate properly. Okay, so problems with activation. Okay, so activation problems. So let's remember how CFTR is activated. So remember, firstly you need that phosphorylation. Okay, then you need ATP to bind to nucleotide binding domain 1. So I'll just get the picture back again. Okay, so you need 
ATP to bind to nucleotide binding domain 1. That doesn't open it, but it causes nucleotide binding domain 1 and nucleotide binding domain 2 to dimerize. Then another ATP can come and bind to nucleotide binding domain 2, and that then causes it to open. If there is some problem with ATP binding, say we have a mutation in this ATP binding site of nucleotide binding domain number 1, then ATP won't bind anymore, okay? Then you're going to end up with problems, basically. Okay, and that is indeed what happens in some of these class 3 mutations. Okay, so any mutation that leads to a problem with the thing actually being activated to open is considered a class 3 mutation. So let me give you an example of a class 3 mutation. So an example of a class 3 mutation is G551D, a very famous example of a class uh, 3 mutation, okay? So delta F508 is the big, big famous mutation of cystic fibrosis. Uh, the second most famous is probably G551D, okay? Um, this, again, it's a mutation that's close by to delta F508, okay? We're looking at very nearby regions here. Okay, so what's happened here? Let me draw the polypeptide again. Here is the amino terminus, here's the C terminus. Remember, the full thing is 1,480 amino acids. And by the way, alpha alpha like that just means amino acids. Okay, uh, and then at position 551, normally you have a G. Now, what does G stand for? Well, G is the single letter amino acid code for glycine, the most simple of all the amino acids, okay? And our group of just a hydrogen atom, okay? And what have we turned it into? In this case, we've taken glycine at position 551 here. Okay, and we have turned it into D. Now, D you would never guess unless you knew. Okay, D is for aspartic acid. Okay, so we have turned glycine into an aspartic acid residue here. Now, where is position 551? Okay, well, position 551 is again in nucleotide binding domain number one. Dun, dun, dun. Right, okay, so... This does not cause it to misfold in the way that delta F508 causes it to misfold, okay? It does not cause the block on synthesis the way R553X caused a block on synthesis, but it does cause problems with when you want to actually activate the CFTR, okay? This replacement of the gua sorry, not of the guanine, of the glycine by an aspartic acid stops the thing being activated, okay? So even though it gets to the cell membrane now, it's not actually going to be activated to be opened by ATP, okay? So it's just going to sit there in the closed state, which isn't very helpful at all, okay? So again, you do get loss of function of the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator. Okay, so that's class 3 mutations. Let's now turn our attention on to class 4 and class 5. Now, class 4 and class 5, I have considerably less to say about these, okay? So, uh, class 4. Class 4, as I say, these are less severe mutations. Class 4 mutations result in reduced conductance, okay? So, if you've got a class 4 mutation in your CFTR protein, it will be synthesized, it will fold correctly, it will get to the cell membrane, it will be activated to open, but then once it actually opens, it isn't very good at letting chloride anions move through it, okay? It's not completely blocked, it will allow some chloride anions to move through it, okay? It's just, it's got a reduced conductance. Its actual ability to allow chloride anions to move through it is reduced. Okay, and that's therefore going to reduce your CFTR function and therefore uh, can lead to mild cystic fibrosis, okay? So if you had two class 4 mutations in your two CFTR genes, that would probably not lead to very severe cystic fibrosis. It might lead to some of the more common symptoms. For instance, if you're male, it might lead to congenital uh, bilateral absence of the vas deferens, but it would be unlikely to cause uh, the symptoms of, for instance, pancreatic deficiency, okay? So, um, a mild form of cystic fibrosis would be caused by class 4 mutations, two class 4 mutations. Okay, right. Then let's move on to finally class 5 mutations. So class 5 mutations are different again. 
Okay, in class 5 mutations, you have reduced expression of the CFTR protein. So what sort of a mutation could lead to reduced expression? Okay, well, generally reduced expression mutations don't actually occur in the portion for CFTR itself. Instead, they're going to occur in the promoter region. Okay, so let me show you this. So, let's let these two parallel lines here uh, represent a double-stranded piece of DNA, again, rather than uh, the inner and outer leaflets of the cell membrane. Okay, and let's say that this portion of the double-stranded DNA here is the CFTR gene. Okay, so this is the CFTR gene. Now, upstream of the CFTR gene, you're going to have a special region known as the promoter region. Now, this is not something that's just special for CFTR. This is something that is upstream of every single uh, gene in eukaryotes, okay, which humans are. Human cells are eukaryotic cells, okay. So, in eukaryotic cells, um, every gene has upstream of it a region known as the promoter region. It's not the case in prokaryotes, but in eukaryotes it is. Okay, now what does the promoter region do? Well, the promoter region is not a portion that's actually going to be translated into uh, a sequence of amino acids. That's the gene. But the promoter region is involved in controlling how much of the gene product you actually produce. So it controls how much of the CFTR that you actually produce. Now, how can it do this? Well, basically, um, in order to actually produce the uh, CFTR protein, you have to get RNA polymerase 2 binding to the DNA, opening it up and working its way down to synthesize the piece of mRNA from the coding strand. Okay, so I'm drawing the mRNA here, okay, which will be complementary to the coding strand. Now, basically, the RNA polymerase 2 enzyme, which, by the way, is often abbreviated down to RNAP2 for RNA, polymerase 2. The RNA polymerase 2 enzyme docks onto the DNA by binding to the promoter region. Now, it's not just one protein. It's a massive great complex of protein. It's a biochemical nightmare, the RNA polymerase 2 enzyme. Okay, but it docks on here, and it works its way along um, the uh, DNA here and synthesizes a piece of mRNA. Okay, so... Basically, the promoter region therefore can control how much CFTR is actually produced because it controls how often the RNA polymerase 2 is actually going to bind here and then work its way along to synthesize a piece of mRNA. And how much mRNA you produce determines how much protein you actually produce. Okay, so if you get mutations in the promoter region of the CFTR gene, which result in the promoter region being less likely to bind RNA polymerase 2, then RNA polymerase 2 will bind here less often. Okay, you'll get less mRNA being produced and therefore less protein being produced. And of course, if you get less protein being produced, you've got less CFTR function. Okay, so function of CFTR has been reduced. Again, these are less severe mutations than the class 1, class 2, class 3 mutations, which result in in complete abolishment of the function of the CFTR, okay? So these will lead to a much less severe disease. And again, in order to actually get the disease, you're going to have to have two copies of um, faulty CFTR genes, okay? Uh, so again, just to make it crystal clear, if you have two class five mutations in your maternal and your paternal genes for CFTR, you will get mild cystic fibrosis. You probably won't get some of the more severe symptoms like pancreatic insufficiency. You'll get the more mild symptoms like congenital bilateral absence of the vas deferens, assuming you are uh, male. Okay, right. So that then is the um, symptoms of cystic fibrosis. Uh, sorry, not the, not the symptoms. That is then the mutations in the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator uh, now finished. What we're going to move on to now is discussing how this loss of function of the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator is actually going to lead to the symptoms of cystic fibrosis. And we're going to begin with the sweating. Okay, right. So from now on, I'm going to assume that you have the most common form of cystic fibrosis, which is 
two Delta F508 mutations. Okay, so n the most common cases of cystic fibrosis have a Delta F508 mutation in the maternal chromosome and also a Delta F508 uh, mutation in the paternal chromosome. And this results in all the CFTR proteins that you produce misfolding and then being destroyed by um, the cell's quality control mechanism. So very few of them actually make it to the cell membrane and therefore you have almost nilch uh, CFTR function. Okay, right. So let's now see why that causes the symptoms that it causes, the, those symptoms that we uh, listed at the beginning of this video. Okay, right. So we're going to then begin with the sweat glands. Okay, why does it make your sweat more salty? Okay, uh, now we're going to begin with the sweat glands, as I said earlier because it really is the simplest one to describe the pathology for because there's no infections, no um, problems with digestion, there's no secondary things basically. It literally is just loss of function of CFTR causes too high salt in the sweat. Okay, and that's why we're going to start off with it because there is no secondary pathology. Okay, right. So, let's start with the sweat glands then. Okay, so the first thing that I need to say is that there are two types of sweat glands, okay? There are what are known as ecrine sweat glands, okay? And there are also what are known as apocrine sweat glands, okay? Now, we are not going to discuss apocrine sweat glands. We are going to discuss ecrine sweat glands, okay? So let me just explain what the difference between these are. So apocrine sweat glands are the ones that you have in the axillary region and also the groin region, okay? They are the ones which develop after puberty and secrete um, mixtures that do not smell great. And an entire industry has spawned which has the sole purpose of trying to cover up the smell of apocrine sweat secretions, okay? We are going to talk about the ecrine sweat glands. The ecrine sweat glands are the ones that you have all over your body, okay? So not just in the axillary regions and the groin, but all over your body, okay? And those are the ones which secrete a salty uh, secretion of water that then evaporates and cools you down. So when you go jogging in the middle of summer and you overheat and you're covered then in sweat, that's because the ecrine sweat glands have been functioning. These are the ones we are going to be concerned with, not the apocrine sweat glands. Okay, right. So, firstly then what I'm going to do is show you the structure of an ecrine sweat gland, okay? And then we'll talk about how they're actually going to secrete sweat. Okay, so, I'm going to draw this in the context of the skin then, okay? So, firstly, let me just explain the two outer layers of the skin, okay? So the outermost layer of the skin, the one that faces the external world, this is what's known as the epidermis, okay? So this layer here, which I'm going to colour in, I'll colour it in, in orange here, this is the epidermis, okay? Right, and then we have these little invaginations of the epidermis down, and the evaginations of the uh, underneath layer which go upwards, okay, so these have special names. The uh, extensions of the underneath layer, which I might as well give you the name of, the layer underneath the epidermis is just the dermis, and that explains why the epidermis is called the epidermis. Epi means around, so it is around the dermis. Okay, so I'll show the dermis then. The dermis is this layer underneath the epidermis that I'm now colouring in in yellow here, okay? Now, these little projections then of the dermis upwards, these are known as reti ridges, okay? So this is a reti ridge, okay? And then the extensions of the epidermis downwards that perfectly interdigitate with the reti ridges, uh, these are known as the reti pegs, okay? So this is a reti peg that I've shown here. Okay, so that's just a little bit about the skin, uh, so that we know where the sweat glands are in context. Now what we're going to draw is a sweat gland here. So what basically happens is the epidermis thins right down, okay, like so, 
and then it's going to turn into uh, a sweat gland basically. So it's going to, the epidermis is an epithelium, okay, but it is a multi-layered epithelium. You have loads of layers of cells piled on top of each other here. It's going to now thin right down to a single celled epithelium and the cell type is going to change. Okay, the cells of the epidermis are squamous, they're very, very flat. These cells are going to be cuboidal, okay, but I'll talk a bit more about that once I've drawn it, okay. So it's going to happen the same on the other side here. Okay, so here's the epidermis on the other side. Again, it's flattening down like this. Then you're going to have a tube going down like this. And then it's going to turn into a coil portion. I'm not going to show too much of this because it takes quite a while to draw this. Okay, right. So now I have to put the other lines in. Okay, so what will happen is it will then coil down here. Okay, and it's a bit of a clumsy, big picture. If you look on the internet, you'll get, I'm sure, more elaborate pictures than this. Okay, right. So, you have these two major portions, then, of, of the sweat gland. Okay, this portion here, which has a cuboidal epithelium lining it. So, all of these cells that are continuous with the epithelium of the epidermis... Oh, dear, what's happened there? That's not good. All of these cells that are continuous then with the epithelium of the epidermis, these are now cuboidal rather than squamous. Okay, so this is a cuboidal epithelium here. Okay, and this straight portion of the sweat gland, this is known as the sweat duct. Okay, so this is the sweat duct. Then the hole that you have in the skin where the sweat duct empties onto, this is known as the sweat pore. Okay, so this hole is the sweat pore. And I will remind you that the epidermis is not a cuboidal epithelium. Okay, it is a stratified, which means multi-layered, okay, squamous epithelium. So it's made up of loads of little flat cells, like so. Stratified squamous epithelium. Okay, right, so let's put some colour onto this. So here we have the sweat duct then, oh dear, I've smudged that nastily, okay, which is a cuboidal epithelium, and I'll highlight all of that in red. And then we've got this portion underneath here, which is supposed to be a coil, okay, let me sort of draw another picture of how I would like this to look, okay, rather than it being like a crab claw here, what it should look like, and I'll draw this as just one line representing the boundary, okay, so this ended up clumsy because I had to draw two lines uh, for each wall, basically, so now what I'm doing is just drawing one line for each wall, okay, and this is the sweat duct here, and then what I'd like this portion underneath to look like is something like this, okay, basically a little coiled tube like this, and this is the actual sweat gland here. Okay, so that's what this is supposed to represent here. Okay, this is the sweat gland. It should look more like this, basically. So the tube becomes coiled and sort of coils into a ball here. Okay, but essentially it is just a tube. Okay, right. So, what then does the ecrine sweat gland do, and I think I'll drop the word ecrine. I, when I say sweat gland from now on, I mean ecrine sweat gland, okay? We've binned the apocrine sweat glands, we're not interested in those. Okay, so what happens then is that the sweat gland down here secretes what is known as the primary uh, secretion, okay? So you get the primary secretion made by the sweat gland, okay? And I should just talk about the cells that line the sweat gland portion. So this coiled portion down here, the cells that line the coiled sweat gland portion are known as coil cells. Okay, so these are coil cells. And they are epithelial cells. And again, it's a cuboidal epithelium, just like the epithelium of the sweat duct. Okay, so these cells that have now a green, brown, black smudge. Okay, these are the coil cells. And they are cuboidal epithelial cells. Okay, so these cells are going to be secreting the primary secretion into the lumen of the sweat gland here. Okay, now what is the primary secretion? Well, it is a solution of salt, basically. Okay, so it's going to contain sodium, ions, and chloride anions uh, in water, basically. Now, it is going to be an isotonic solution 
to uh, the extracellular fluid and to the blood. Okay, so it's going to have the same concentration of solute in it as does the uh, blood and the extracellular fluid, and that's quite a high concentration of sodium chloride. Okay, so the primary secretion that's secreted by these coil cells is going to have a very high concentration of sodium chloride in this water, basically. Okay, and it's going to be isotonic, so it's going to have the same solute concentration within it as the extracellular fluid. Okay, the, the fluid here and the fluid here will have the same water potential, the same osmolarity, whatever little piece of nomenclature you prefer to use. It means that the solute concentration is going to be the same. There is going to be no osmotic gradient between here and here. Okay, right. Then, what's going to happen is this fluid is going to go up the sweat duct, okay, and then the situation changes. The sweat duct becomes completely impermeable to water, okay? So this cuboidal epithelium now is very watertight, okay? So water cannot cross this cuboidal epithelium, okay? And what then is going to happen is the cuboidal epithelial cells of the sweat duct are going to remove sodium and chloride from the solution. Okay, so they're going to be removing salt from the solution, which now means that the solute concentration in here is going to go down. Now, you might say, well, that's going to create an osmotic gradient between here and here, so surely water will move across. But I've just said that this epithelium is really watertight, so water can't move. Okay, so basically what ends up happening is you create sweat then that is hypotonic to the extracellular fluid meaning it's got a lower solute concentration than the extracellular fluid, okay? And then you secrete this sweat onto the surface of your skin, and it's a hypotonic solution to the extracellular fluid, and it has a low salt concentration within it. In cystic fibrosis, what we're going to see is that um, these sweat duct cells are going to break because of the problem with CFTR and they're not going to reabsorb the sodium chloride that they're supposed to. And therefore, you're going to end up with sweat that has a far too high salt concentration within it. Okay, so we'll call this video here and we'll discuss the more in-detailed mechanisms of the coil cells and the uh, cuboidal epithelium of the sweat duct cells, okay, in the next video. But the last thing that I just want to say before we say anything else is that uh, these coil cells in the actual sweat gland portion here, these are stimulated to secrete the primary secretion by acetylcholine. Okay, so acetylcholine being released by sympathetic nervous system nerves is going to cause the coil cells of the sweat gland to actually begin the secretion of the primary uh, fluid, okay, which is then going to move up the sweat duct, have the sodium chloride resorbed, uh, and then uh, emerge as sweat. Okay, now remember, these sympathetic nervous system nerves here are very special. Most sympathetic nervous system nerves do not release acetylcholine, okay? Um, well, I need to add a little word in there. Most postganglionic uh, sympathetic nervous system nerves do not release acetylcholine, okay? Uh, the Preganglionic sympathetic nervous system neurons do, of course, release acetylcholine, but most postganglionic sympathetic nervous system nerves are adrenergic. They release noradrenaline. Okay, so these are very special sympathetic nervous system nerves that release acetylcholine, and this acetylcholine stimulates the coil cells to begin the secretion of the primary fluid. Okay, so when you are overheating. It's the sympathetic nervous system nerves which release acetylcholine that are going to become active, and that's what turns the ecrine sweat glands on. Okay, right. So that's an overview of the sweat glands and their function and what is going to go wrong in cystic fibrosis. In the next video, what we'll do is we'll look at the in-detailed mechanisms of these coil cells and also the cuboidal epithelial cells of the sweat duct uh, and we'll see how they're actually going to secrete the primary secretion and how they're going to reabsorb sodium and chloride in the case of these sweat duct cells. And then we'll see how loss of function of CFDR is going to not cause any problems with the coil cells, but is going to cause a problem with the sweat duct cells and how that's going to lead to too salty sweat.